Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank um, Murdad for inviting me here in the McGovern for hosting this. It's a real privilege, particularly because I was a postdoc here at MIT, and in fact, three out of the ten panel members were my contemporaries at the time. So it's like a mini reunion for me, which is great fun. I spent most of my time thinking about sort of low-level sensory motor control. So, you know, when you want to handle some object as a can, you might have to learn some control... Learn some control... Better? Learn some control policy as a function of the state of the limb, such as position and velocity. And this control policy may have some interesting shape. Now, because of noise in sensory inputs, you may not look quite where you are on the surface. So you'll have to do some clever Bayesian inference, for example, to estimate that. And even if you knew where you were on that surface, because of variability in the motor output, there may be problems producing the correct control. But that's at a very low level for a single task. But if you think about things more generally, not everything is a simple can. And if we think about the next level up, tasks can vary in terms of their parameters. So you can deal with cans of different sizes and shapes. And maybe as you deal with them, you have to learn, for example, how to modulate this control policy for different can sizes. And if you were a good Bayesian, <coughs> you'd learn something about the distribution of possible cans. But again, not everything in this world is a can. And in fact, there are different structures in the world. For example, there are cans, there are power tools, different families of objects which might have different sort of input-out relationships and require fundamentally different control laws. Now, most of the tasks we do in the lab effectively confuse, for example, structures versus parameters. If you learn one task, it's hard to separate the structure from the parameters. And so the only way you can begin to learn about those is by experiencing many examples of a particular structure. Today, what I want to try and cover is issues to do with how you might learn things about structures and parameters, or how you extract priors from the world, and particularly techniques for extracting natural priors. And then I'm going to move on to talking about learning internal models in terms of structural learning and temporal context. And if there's time at the very end, I might talk a little bit about decision making. OK, here's how I think about internal models. Okay? And I think this view of internal models is exactly consistent with all the views we've had so far, just more general. So we can think in general that the world generates data for us and has structure. So in general, there's a true generative model in the world which generates things, maybe objects, features, states of the body. Okay? And given the generation of those objects, features, or states, the physics of our senses and our body generates some sensory stimuli. And these distributions may well be probabilistic distributions because things may be stochastic. So that's the real world. But what about inside the brain? Well, it would be very useful for the brain to have some knowledge of these true properties of the world. And so what I think of as internal models is things which capture aspects of those true situations. So we have, for example, a model on our side, inside our brain which may tell us how we expect to see objects, features, or states of the world, and another model which might tell us, given a particular state of the world, what the probability of different sensory inputs is. So these are two sorts of forms of internal representations. And the point is that if you have these, then if you get a particular sensory stimulus, you can use this thing here, which we call the prior, to turn this arrow around and generate what we want, which is the probability of a particular state of the world given our sensory input, the percept. Now, this may sound like something completely different from all this efference copy, predictive forward models on motor control, but it's actually identical. It's just more general in that efference copy is just one part of things you can use to predict or estimate states. Now, you might say, well, that's all very well. How much evidence is there in neuroscience for these sorts of Bayesian internal models? Well, the answer is, oh, there's a lot. For example, back 10 years ago, a nice review about object perception is Bayesian inference. So great, <coughs> the way we perceive the world is Bayesian. Well, what about motor control? Well, we wrote some reviews saying you can explain some features of sensory motor control in a Bayesian framework. What about higher level things? Josh Tenenbaum has shown very nicely with Tom Griffiths, inductive learning and reasoning are all very Bayesian. And what about attention? Well, clearly Bayesian inference theory of attention. Don't worry about that. But what about diseases, you ask me? Don't worry. Schizophrenia is a Bayesian disease. <laughs> there must be some things in this world which aren't Bayesian. What about mirror neurons? Don't worry. Mirror neurons, they're Bayesian as well. Well, that's fine. So humans are Bayesian, but surely animals, they can't be Bayesian. What about owls? It's all fine. <laughs> owls' behavior predicted by Bayesian inference. Well, that's all very good, but surely it's just the whole system, not little small parts of it like neurons. Neurons can't be Bayesian. Well, they can be Bayesian. So Bayesian model predicts responsive actions to molecular gradients. Everything is Bayesian, internal models at every level. In fact, 
There's so many internal models of the brain, I no longer think of the arm, or the brain having an internal model of the arm. I now think of the arm being an external model of the brain. <laughs> so the Bayesian world has really taken over. But there's some issues. What are the natural priors we have about the world? How do we acquire these natural priors and what are they? Well, one would hope the priors are adapted to natural statistics to be of any use. And so there are many studies where people record the true statistics and show that people behave as though they've internalized it. And this is a nice example from Tom Griffiths and George Tenenbaum, where you ask people questions about lifespans. And I won't go into it just in case he may cover this. But given a true distribution of lifespans, you can show that people have some understanding of that distribution when they answer questions. Or you can go try to measure people's priors for simple scalar priors. For example, here's a measure of the priors people have for speeds of objects. Here's speed versus the relative probabilities. This dashed line would be a Gaussian distribution, and this is what's measured from a subject, showing it has heavier tails. Or you can measure the priors people have for the way lights shine from, and lights kind of shine above, from just above and from the left. Or you could do studies of simple low-level psychophysics like we've done, and this is a study actually which Jorn Dijkstra mentioned, where we measured the prior of a visual motor transformation. But you could even go to more cognitive domains, for example. For example, this is a nice one from Sanborn and Griffiths, where they try to measure something about the cognitive representations of categories of different sorts of animals. But this sort of task is really limited to one task at a time. So there's a problem with all these studies in that priors are really a bunch of free parameters in these studies, which you can go and fit to the data. And a lot of critics of the Bayesian approach will say, whatever touch you come up with, of course you can construct a prior which will make us fit the data. And therefore, it's just a curve-fitting exercise. And the true advantage of priors is that they should generalize across tasks. And almost all these studies, apart from actually this one here, which is a very simple prior, only look at priors within a simple, simple task. So the goal of the study I'm going to tell you about is to really ask the question for high-level priors, oh, do we have priors across tasks, or are we learning things in a handcrafted way? And the reason this is important, it maps onto two fundamental ways we can learn about the world. So there's discriminative learning. I can show you these faces parameterized in some space, and I can say, learn these are male versus female, and you might learn some line in the space which separates them. And when I give you another task, such as old versus young, you learn another line. So you're doing some sort of regression or super support vector machine to separate out in this task space for different tasks. The alternative to that is a generative model, where you first learn something about the fundamental properties of faces, a sort of generative model of how faces are developed, and you learn that in a statistical way. <coughs> and then that's the first stage of processing before you go on to apply that same underlying representation to many tasks. So the critical thing is that discriminative learning will lead to a task-dependent representation, whereas generative leads to a task-independent underlying representation, which we think of as the prior. And so I'm going to tell you about a technique we've developed with Matej Lengel called cognitive tomography, which aims to extract high-dimensional priors from low-dimensional measurements. So like tomography, we're going to take very low-dimensional measurements and we're going to create high-dimensional representations. That's the idea. One of the reviewers hate this term. I rather like it. Um, OK, so we're going to work with faces. So I'm really out of my comfort zone here. I, I, I'm not a face person. I'm not a vision person. But it was a nice example to look at whether the technique works. And so what we take is we take a well-known data set from Basel where they've scanned in many, many faces. And they've worked out the physical structures of faces and done principal components analysis on the structures. So this is the first principal component, second principal component. This is minus four to plus four standard deviations in face space. And so this shows you the corners of the face space. And what we might imagine is that a subject might have some prior subjective distribution over faces shown by the sort of gray scale here. And that's our prior. And what we can do is give them a task. We can show them, let's say, pairs of faces as a stimulus. And we can get them to give us responses one or two very low dimensional responses. And what we want to do is effectively extract this subjective distribution from the stimulus and responses. And to do that, we have to have a hypothesis how they're going to use the subjective distribution and the stimuli to produce response. And we also are going to include a whole bunch of what we call nuisance parameters, such as noises and biases in the perception and decision making. Now, we're not interested in this at all. So what we're going to do is effectively from this ideal observer, invert it and Given the stimulus and the response, we're going to factor out the noise and biases and estimate this distribution using machine learning techniques. Now, if you want to know about these techniques, you'll be very happy to know the reviewers pushed the supplementary material up to 26 pages of validation of these techniques and controls. So you're welcome to go and read that. Um, it's it's long-winded, but we've tested that out on artificial data in various ways that it, it's validated.
OK, here are the two tasks. The first task is a very simple one, familiarity. We choose two faces randomly distributed among our faces, and we ask which one's more familiar. OK, very simple task. And the second task is we show three faces and we say which one's the odd one out of them. Now, these may sound like similar tasks to you, but they're actually fundamentally very different. This one requires you to compare each face with some internal representation of familiar faces. This one requires you to compare the three faces to a chart to choose the one which is somehow least likely the other two. Now, we can model these in very simple ways. Given a subjective distribution here, it's going to be very clear the one which has a higher probability under your subjective distribution will on average be more familiar, subject to noises and perception and noises and decision making and lapses of concentration. When it comes to this task here, we use something from, the, from uh, Josh Tenenbaum's work where effectively we assume that what's generating these three faces is you choose two faces from the distribution and then one of them is corrupted to produce two other faces here. Yeah? And these two other faces are more similar than the one over here. So you have three different hypotheses as to which one was generated and not corrupted, and that's the odd one out. Okay. So we give a 1,000 trials of each of these tasks to 10 subjects, and then we extract their posterior, their subjective distribution. And here's one example for one of our subjects. As you can see, the underlying distribution is highly structured. It's not a simple Gaussian in this two-dimensional space. And if we look then at another subject doing the same task, we see a st strikingly different subjective distribution. So across two subjects, we get very different distributions extracted from this task. On the other hand, if we look at another task in the same subject, this was familiarity, this was odd one out, we get very similar distributions across tasks, but very different across subjects. And if we look at all 10 subjects, what we see is often very idiosyncratic among each subject, but very similar among the tasks. Now, you'll notice as I go down this list, they become more dissimilar. And there's a good reason for that. We can measure for each subject how consistent they are by repeating the first 100 trials they do of each task and the last 100 in a random order and random position to see how consistent they answer the same way. And what I've done is I've ranked task 10 subjects from most consistent to least consistent. Okay? And if subjects are very non-consistent, it's actually quite hard to extract their, um, their, their subject to distribution. And that shows here, here's the average consistency, fully consistent, very inconsistent, and the difference between these two measured by the Jensen-Shannon divergence decreases as you become more consistent. So it suggests that we have a subjective distribution which is used across two tasks. Now, the real proof of the pudding is prediction. This looks impressive, but can we take data and predict new responses? What we can do is we can take each subject's data set, split it in half many times, fit our model, and then predict the other half of their data within a trial. And that's shown here. Here's the familiarity task, and here's our 10 subjects ranked from the most to the least consistent. Here's chance in our prediction, and we're significantly above chance in all these cases in terms of our ability to predict their responses in the other half of the data set. Similarly, for the odd one out task, we're above chance by a long way. How close to optimal are we? Well, it turns out we can calculate that because given their consistency scores, we can know what the true upper bound is on our ability to predict. And what I'm showing you here for all our subjects is the consistency score, and this boundary is how well we should ever be able to predict given how consistent they are. And effectively, we're very close to the upper boundary, particularly for the familiarity, and we're close to it for the odd one out task. What about taking the prior we get from this and applying it to this other task to predict across tasks, and it turns out we do very well on that as well. So having extracted distributions familiarity, we can predict odd one out, and similarly if we take odd one out, we can do a good job of predicting familiarity. And this just shows you the group data again within task, across task prediction. We can also ask how important are the fine details of these distributions. If we fit our distribution, and then we replace it with a bivariate Gaussian of the same mean and covariance, so we moment match it, and we use this now to predict, we do significantly worse, particularly within tasks. And if we take a state-of-the-art predictor, a Gaussian process classifier, and just apply it directly to the data to try and predict subjects' data, we actually do better than that for both our situations. If we had more data, the Gaussian process will win in the end, but with limited data, fitting with the prior actually does better. And more than that, we can show that in this odd one out task, subjects are not p p picking the most familiar or least familiar. That fits the data very poorly. So it suggests that priors for faces are highly structured, subject-specific and predictive behavior across tasks. 
And the fact they're invariant across tasks really suggests strongly they're acquired by a generative process rather than a discriminative process. Now, we think this technique can be extended to higher dimensions and to other tasks, and we think it's an exciting opportunity to sort of link in to both neurophysiology and also to imaging work with this. One of the tricky things about extending it is as you go to higher dimensions, you need a lot more training data from the subjects. And so one way to get around that is to have active learning. At the moment, the algorithms which fit this are too slow to fit between each trial of a subject. And so with new machine learning techniques, we hope to be able to choose the best next data uh, samples to give to the subjects to extract the most amount of information. So I want to move back now to my, my homeland of motor control and talk a bit about learning internal models. We've been very interested in the idea of structural learning, the idea that it's important to learn about structures of the world separate from the parameters of the world. And so we think about structural learning in the following way. When you learn to ride a couple of bicycles, you can pretty much ride any bicycle, even if they've got different sort of shapes and parameters or wheel sizes. And it could be the way you do this is when you learn to ride a bicycle, you have to set up some parameters in your head, be they synaptic weights, and here in some very high dimensional space is the blue bicycle and the, the orange bicycle and the pink bicycle. Now, if you have to explore that entire parameter space, it's going to be very slow. If you can learn that all bicycles lie on a lower dimensional manifold, here I'm showing you one dimension, but it could be a multi-dimensional, then effectively you can restrict your exploration along that particular manifold. So that when you come to a bike, you can effectively have a privileged superhighway to zoom between um, the parameters for these different bicycles. Okay? And if you have other bicycle-like objects which look similar but don't share the same structure, well, it's, it's bad news. They lie off your structure, and there'll be rather little generalization between the two. So how can we test the idea that structures are important? Well, one way to do this is to use something which is very common in motor control, and that's interference. If you learn a task, for example, a visual motor rotation or prism, or a, ro a robot pushing on your arm, your error will tend to come down with time, and if you sample away for minutes to weeks later, they'll come back and carry on pretty much where they left off, uh, so they can store motor memories over long periods of time. On the other hand, if they do a task, and you send them away for minutes to weeks and bring them back and give them the opposite task, and by opposite task I mean if the prism deviated their vision to the left, it now does it to the right, if the robot initially pushed them to the left, it now pushes them to the right, you see they're worse than they would have been had they never experienced this first task. And so we think of that as antrograde interference. And then if you send them away for minutes to weeks, bring them back, and give them the first task, well, they've forgotten it. Okay? So this opposite task tends to wipe out the first task, retrograde interference. Now, the way you can think about this is here are the two tasks. Here's the red <coughs> task and the blue task. They're just two spots in space. There's no, nothing that links them up as part of a structure. They're just two examples of things out there. So when you learn the red task, you're over here, you're very far from the blue. When you go to the blue, you're very far from the red, and vice versa. And our hypothesis is maybe we can make this part of a structure by effectively joining them up. Okay? So if they can experience things which join these two things up, they might learn a path between them <coughs> which will allow them to generalize rapidly along the structure. So the experiment we're going to do is a very simple one. We use visual motor rotations like you've heard before. You move in one direction, we rotate visual feedback. And we can change the rotation on every trial if we want to. So we have a very simple experiment. <coughs> Subjects in, in our control group perform 800 trials under veridical feedback, just like using a computer mouse. Very boring. We then give them a block of 60-degree rotations to the right, 60 to the left, <coughs> 60 to the right, and we see what we expect to see. The error is big here, and it reduces over the 50 or so trials. When we then go to the opposite one, they have a very big error because they're pointing the wrong way, they relearn it. When we get back to the original one, well, they've forgotten most of it. Okay, so the typical interference we see. But then we have our group where we try to impose structural learning on them. And we do that by, for these 800 trials at the beginning, giving them a new random rotation sampled uniformly from minus 90 to 90 every eight trials. It's horrible to be a subject in this experiment. It's like using our computer mouse, where someone rotates the mouse in your hand randomly every eight times you point with. People get very frustrated. We pay them lots of money to sit there, and they'll do it. And what we all think is happening is here's minus 60, here's plus 60, and we're linking them up through sort of the rotations, a sort of low-dimensional representation in that space. Now, having done that, when we go to our plus 60, what we see is within a few trials, they're down at really baseline performance, really rapid. Now, they've learned this now better than our control group, so in theory, they're sort of further away from the blue now. 
But yet when we switch, and they don't know when the switch is going to come, within a few trials, they're down at baseline again. And when we switch back, again, within one or two trials, they're down at baseline. Suggesting that having experienced the structure, we see very rapid switching between these opposing things. Now, the, the motor control aficionados in the room will know there have been two recent papers, one from Shadmir's group, one from Nozaki's group, saying you can explain all this with very simple low-level models. The Shadmir model says all you're learning is to be more sensitive to all errors because you've experienced lots of errors and therefore you're faster to adapt. And the Nozaki one says, oh, just store all of those memory, just store them all in memory and you can just replay them when they come back out. Well, there's a problem, I think, with both of those models. It's because they basically fit this data, and if all we'd done with this, that would be fine. But what they ignore is the critical control we actually did to test whether it was really a structure you're learning or whether it's the experience of the perturbations or the errors. So the other problem with those studies, they're all one-dimensional, and it's basically impossible to have an interesting structure in one dimension, and if you put the representation to one dimension, everything becomes very easy. So the critical control is that we have a group who experience 800 trials where again they get a new perturbation every eight trials. But for 10% of those, they get minus 60, lots of experience of this. And 10% they get plus 60, so lots of experience of these two. And the other 80%, they get a combination of rotation, a shearing, and a scaling. So a really horrible visual motor transformation. And so the way we think about this is we ensure they get lots of experience here, lots here, but there's no low dimensional path between the two. It just covers a whole visual motor rotation space. So there's no structure linking them up in that sense. So what we find in this group is effectively they perform no differently than our control group. They learn nothing about the structure. Okay? Even though they've experienced lots of errors and they could have stored all these things in memory as well. So it suggests to us that after structured but random learning, we see structure-specific facilitation and we see structure-specific interference reduction. And we think structure learning is actually an important part of life. I think most of what we do as adults is parametric learning. I know about properties of tools. What I don't know is the particular viscosity, elasticity, the inertia of the objects I have to handle. And I have to basically parameterize them very quickly. But I think as you're very young, what you're learning about is the structure of objects you have to interact with. And in fact, we've got some evidence that when you learn parameters, you have a different sort of time course of learning, a single exponential, compared to when you learn more complicated things, which tend to have double exponentials, as though you're learning structures and parameters at the same time. I don't want you to go away thinking there's no way you can store opposing things. That was storing opposing things when you've got no other cues. And of course, you could give people cues when they have these different opposing perturbations. So here's a typical example. Here you can have people hold a robot, and the robot's going to produce forces which act at right angles to the direction of motion, and always are proportional in magnitude to the speed of the movement, so-called curl force field. And I have to give credit to MIT, to Neville Hogan and Emilio Beatsy, for the first people, I believe, to build these robots and really transform a lot of the work we do by allowing us to produce these complex robotic state-dependent forces. So these are very nice. You can produce this, and what you can do is on Random trials, you can randomly alternate between the right and left on each trial. Just randomly choose right or left force fields. And you can even tell people, when this cue is on here, you're going to get a right force field. And when this one's on, you're going to get a leftward force field. Okay, so they have all the information they need. And what you find is, before the perturbation come on, they, they're basically accurate. This is the deviation from a straight line. The force field comes on, and over the course of an hour, they basically learn nothing at all. Okay, so you can't learn stuff just when you're told it or when you have a visual cue. And in fact, even though this looks like a bit of learning, this is just stiffening up, because when we turn it off unexpectedly, there's no after effect. But a number of years ago, Wayne Scott um, and colleagues showed that if you do something before, half a second before, you can get a small amount of learning. And we were interested to explore this in a bit more detail. So the question is, does the lead into a movement help you separate motor memories? So now we have people start at either the left or right target, they move in, dwell here for a particular amount of time, and then move through the force field. So there's no force field on this initial movement, a force in the second movement, but the direction of the force field is totally predicted by whether you move in from the left or the right. And in different groups of subjects, they have to dwell between zero and 1,000 milliseconds. If you move in and have to wait 1,000 milliseconds, you get almost no learning. It's just basically stiffening up a little bit. If you only wait half a second, you get very little learning, similar to the Wayne Scott study. If you only have to wait 150 milliseconds, you get substantial learning. And if you don't have to wait at all, you get really impressive learning. So effectively, what you do in about the 500 milliseconds before a movement is really critical for how you can access separate motor memories, access a very strong cue to separate motor memories. <laughs> 
Now, this was interesting to us for a particular reason, because it leads me on to think about a problem which has always bugged me about following through in sport. When you play a ball sport and you make contact with the ball or you release a ball, you're told somehow to follow through the movement. But yet, anything you do after you release or make contact with the ball can't affect the ball at all. So there's all these theories about what well, it's wear and tear, it's how you plan the movement that matters. But if we think about it, if the lead-in determines which motor memory you activate now, could the follow-through determine retroactively the motor memory you have now? And so the idea is we're going to ask people to make a movement through the force field, and then without the force field being on, we either, they either stop there, so the no-follow-through group, Sorry, let me go through the no follow through. They move through the force field and stop. And they have a cue which tells them which force field they're going to get, a little target. But they just stop there. And now I flip the axes around. Zero means no learning, 100 means perfect learning. This group learns nothing at all, okay, as we expect. However, if we have a follow through group who move through the force field and then either go to the left after that or to the right, and the direction of the future movement is going to determine the force field we get, what we see now is substantial learning. So what you're going to do after you've done a skill has a huge effect on your ability to separate the motor memories for that skill. So that's great if you want to learn two different things, but normally when we're doing sport, we want to learn one thing, the right golf swing and so on. So flipping it on its head, what it would mean is if you're learning a single skill and you always make a consistent follow-through, you're going to put that into one motor memory. If, on the other hand, for every movement you make a different follow-through, you're going to be spreading your learning across motor memories. So the prediction is one group of subjects do a consistent follow-through, one does a variable follow-through, and what we predict is you should be faster in this condition. This is a very simple task, then. There's no opposing force fields here. And what we see here for the red group, which is our consistent follow-through, they're significantly faster to learn this than the inconsistent follow-through group. Okay? Now, by the end of half an hour or so, they get to the same level. It's not a very difficult task to learn. Could these sort of lead-in and follow-throughs really account for real-world real motor learning properties? Well, we can ask that by giving people what we thought was going to be a very easy task to learn. Okay? We're going to give people a lead-in and a follow-through, and the skill they're going to get will depend on both the lead-in and the follow-through. So they start from one of these two starting locations. They're going to end at one of these two target locations. They know that for each trial. And they get a force field between these two via points, and the direction of the force field depends on the start location, target location, according to the exclusive or rule, the nonlinear rule. So in this case, if they go along the red paths, they get one force field. They go along the blue paths, they get the other. So you can't predict which force field you get based on where you start or where you end. It has to be the combination of both of them. Okay? So it should be a very simple thing to do. We bring people in for five days, for an hour and a half a day. And over the course of those five days, they slowly learn this up to about 55% um, of full learning. So even for the simple task, much simpler than a you know, golf, golf stroke, it takes a long time to learn to separate these motor memories, for example, based on leading and follow through. And by the end of it, we see they're doing the appropriate things for the four conditions, about half and the appropriate exclusive all rule. So it suggests that what you activate now in terms of motor memory depends on the recent past, about the 500 milliseconds. It probably depends on the recent future. We haven't mapped out the time course of this. It would be very surprising if it depends on further into the future and the past. It's a weaker effect of the future. And so as you move through time, the recent history has a huge effect on what you store in motor memory. So what would the optimal follow-through be? Well, if you wanted to make the best follow-through, it should be the one which has least variables, so you're storing things in the same motor memory, so you want to follow through in a way that you can do consistently. That would be a sensible thing to do. So it suggests that recent paths of future actions determine the current motor memory and allows us to separate out different motor skills. I've got a few minutes left, so I'm going to shrink motor control down a bit and get into dangerous territories here. Because in all the tasks we do, we tell people, here's the task you have to do, go do it. But in reality, unfortunately, there are these things called decisions which come on top of all that, which we ignore in motor control. You know, we, we just think we tell people what to do. It's much easier that way. And so one question we can ask is, to what extent does the motor system know about the decision-making system? There's these lovely models in decision-making, drift diffusion models. There are also lovely models on motor control, optimal feedback control. But they completely don't talk to each other. They're completely separate models which say, you make a decision, then I'll take over for the next bit for the movement. So often we think of it in this way. Um, I accumulate evidence. I watch a bunch of dots. They're going left or right. I have to accumulate evidence. I hit a bound. I make a decision that's left. Uh, my central executive then says, right, let's do left. I plan the movement and I execute it. That's one way to do it. 
But the question we want to address is, could there be a more continuous flow of information from this decision process to the movement process, even before a decision has been made? And what we really want to do is relate variables here. So as you accumulate evidence here, we call the sort of number the decision variable, how, how much evidence you've accumulated, to things which optimal feedback control cares about, setting up reflex gains to basically control the muscles. And so what we want to do is have a task where in every trial we can estimate both the decision variable and the reflex gain and ask how they're related to each other, hopefully before a decision has been made. And to do that, we have a very simple experiment. A subject sits at one of our robotic devices, and they sit there with a hand here, and they watch one of these random dot kinematograms. This is a task where some of the dots are on any trial are either moving in the elbow flexor or extensor direction, and the rest are moving very randomly. And so in this case, it's a very easy trial. They're moving in the flexor direction. And your job is, when asked, to respond to the direction of the dots by moving your hand in that direction to the flexor or extensor target. And the cue to move is that we control the duration of the stimulus. Two things happen to tell you to move. One is the dots go off, and the second is, at the same time, the hand of the robot moves one centimeter in 80 milliseconds. So it's a very fast movement of the hand, and that sets up effectively um, an, e an EMG response here, effectively sets up a reflex response to a stretch reflex. And so we're going to measure the EMG of the flex and extensors to measure the strength of that reflex response, which is pulling you, trying to pull you back in the flexion direction. You then respond, say which target you think it is, and we tell you whether you're right or wrong. And so we're going to use the behavioral data to try and work out the decision variable, and then we're going to use this data to work out the reflex gain. So the way we do that is here's the viewing duration, which we control, and here's the difficulty of the task, the percentage of dots moving in the same direction, from 3% very hard to 51% very easy. The longer you view for, the better you get, and the higher the coherence or the percentage of dots, the better you do, not surprisingly. Now, we can fit this data with a one-parameter model, which is very simple, which says... Given the dots, I generate, they're noisy, my brain's noisy, so I get a Gaussian distribution with a mean that depends on the coherence. And there's a single parameter which links the coherence to the mean of this Gaussian. I then integrate over the time, and when you cue me to respond, if I've got positive numbers, I'm in flexion due to a flexion movement. If I've got negative, it's an extension movement. And there's one parameter, so effectively the decision variable is going to be normally distributed, some unknown k times our coherence times time with a variance of time. So fitting that one parameter model to our data, we can do a reasonably good job of accounting for that data. And that means on any trial, we can say, what would the decision variable distribution have been on that trial? We know the answer you give, so we can truncate it and take the average of that truncated as our estimate on that trial of your decision variable. We also want to get the reflex gain. The motion display comes on. It goes off. We perturb you, and we look at this tiny amount of time here, 150 milliseconds or so, and we measure the EMG. And I'm not going to go through details of how we process it, but what we actually get is a net measure of the EMG in favor of the direction you're going to make your decision in, okay, when, we, when you finish off. Okay, so it's the reflex gain in that direction. Okay. And so what we're going to do is sum it up over the three time periods. This is the monosynaptic stretch response, which shouldn't be adaptive on these sorts of time scales, the medium latency and the long latency response over here. So now we get a measure in every trial. So what we want to plot is the decision variable we think you have in your head, okay, based on our model, against the reflex gain we measure from the smallest amount of decision variables, sort of zero here, as we increase it. And what are the possibilities? Well, one possibility is it's flat, effectively, in that you don't turn on your reflex in an interesting way until you're cued to move. You just wait, make the decision, and then sequentially you know, decide and act. Another possibility is you need a certain amount of evidence before you bother getting the motor system involved and turning it on in some way. Some threshold has to be crossed before you get there. But what we see, shown here in a single subject and in our group data, is that for the monosynaptic one, G1, which is like our control, it's flat. That's what we expect it to be. We don't expect that to adapt. But even for the one at 45 to 75 milliseconds after the perturbation, we see a beautiful, almost linear increase in reflex gain as a function of the decision variable. From the very smallest amounts of evidence you get, on average, you're pushing your gain up. And more than so, even for the long latency reflex. Now, there's no reason this should be linear. It should be monotonically increasing for it to make sense. But it suggests you're pre-tuning your motor system for the sort of confidence you have in the decision you're going to finally make. Why would you bother doing this? Well, it turns out you get to the target faster by doing this. By pre-tuning your reflexes, it helps you get to the target quickly and therefore saves you some time. So we think there's a continuous flow from decision processes to the skeletal motor system. 
And effectively, the CNS provides decision process information to it um, about the certainty of the upcoming task. OK, I'm running out of time. I hope I convinced you the brain represents probabilistic internal models. Um, we think cognitive tomography is a fun technique to use to extract high dimensional representations and suggests that even for a very well learned task of face recognition, we have generative models. That learning structures in the world is important. Time will tell whether the two recent papers overturn this idea. We're doing experiments to test that at the moment. We think temporal contexts are really vital for the way you access um, different memories and that there's a strong interaction of decision making and reflex control. And I'd like to thank all my collaborators here and my funders, and thank you for your time. <laughs>